All right. Greetings, everyone. This is the CHIP Landmark Ideas Series, and I'm extremely pleased to have with us today Julie Gerberding, the uh, CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health on building pandemic resilience through disruptive public health innovation. This is the CHIP Landmark Ideas Series. I'm Ken Mandel. I direct the Computational Health Informatics Program here at Boston Children's Hospital. We're a 29-year-old program in biomedical informatics, and you can learn more about us at www.chip.org. The Landmark Ideas Series is an event featuring thought leaders across healthcare, informatics, IT, big science, innovation, and more. If you want to follow along uh, on social media, these are our Twitter handles. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Gerberding. She'll give her presentation, and then we'll have a, a vigorous discussion that will be driven by your putting your questions into the Zoom Q&A box as we go. Then we'll have some closing remarks. So uh, Dr. Gerberding is the CEO of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Formerly, she was the Executive Vice President and Chief Patient Officer at Merck, where she was responsible for patient engagement, strategic communications, global public policy, population health, and corporate responsibility. And I know her best from when she was the Director of the United States CDC from 2002 to 2009, where she led the agency through more than 40 emergency responses to public health crises, including SARS in 2003. I had the privilege of serving on Dr. Gerberding's advisory committee to the director of the CDC with uh, an absolute blue ribbon, uh, a group of other advisors that it was a privilege to know. And I only have two or three things that I put up on the walls of my office. And one of them is this uh, beautiful uh, patchwork uh, uh, remembrance of the, of, the, of the committee service um, that Dr. Gerberding had made by um, genuine uh, American folk art artists for the, uh, uh, for the committee. It's, it's a small patchwork quilt. And uh, getting this kind of uh, thank you um, tells you a lot about who Dr. Gerberding is and what her leadership style is. Uh, and I want to hear more about that now. Um, at a moment, as the pandemic becomes officially declared uh, at its end uh, by the White House, this is a very good moment to begin to reflect back and to also look forward at uh, how uh, to have the most uh, uh, strong and effective public health system in the United States. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gerberding. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to have a chance to participate in this conversation. And I've been really looking forward to it for some time. It's kind of ironic that this topic is on the agenda as we are coming to the government's official declaration that the pandemic is over. Um, although I think the fact that we are still experiencing upward of 350 deaths a day um, suggests that it's not quite over for everyone and there are still people who need to be cautious and careful and I'm really sorry about that. What I wanted to kind of frame today was um, how we can think about going forward in the long run after we do fully recover from the pandemic and what we need to be thinking about differently across our public health system as we build our resilience and really employ a different approach to some of the critical capacities that we need to be truly safe from a pandemic. So on my next slide, I just summarize not all by any stretch of the imagination, but a few of the lessons that I think we've learned in the context of the current pandemic. Um, first of all, we've been blessed with the scientific advances of even the last decade 
and how they helped bring so many countermeasure tools and ideas to the table as quickly as they did. So science is clearly on our side, but unfortunately our science is emerging in the context of a society that is lacking in sustained commitment and investment in not just solving the problems that are in front of us, but staying the course so that we can have progressive improvement in our pandemic resilience and not have to go back to square one every time um, we get past the critical point. I think we've also learned that while we were fast, we weren't fast enough to protect the 100 million people who developed SARS across the United States and the uh, scores more than that around the world. We were fast getting vaccines out, but not fast enough. We were fast getting antivirals, monoclonals, and other interventions out, but not fast enough given the speed with which this virus basically globalized in a heartbeat. One of the most poignant aspects of the pandemic, in addition to just the tremendous loss of life and hardship that the disease itself has caused, is that it has reminded us once again how amazingly unequal health access is in the United States and globally. We really have had to stare straight into the eyes of those people who were not just harmed because they experienced a health threat, but were harmed because they couldn't pay their rent, couldn't find ways to feed their family, many of whom had to continue working and putting themselves at risk because they had no choice if they wanted to maintain their basic uh, household services and, and commitments. And then finally, and probably the most heartfelt for me is that while we have come this far, we're not through this crisis yet, and that and yet the cycle of complacency and crisis is already way too evident. On the next slide, I'm hearkening back to 2019 when the commission uh, uh, that was uh, supported by the Gates Foundation and established at the CSIS, the Center for Strategic International Studies, um, pulled together a number of experts from across the global health, public health, medical communities, the policy world to really come together and say, how do we get out of this cycle of crisis and complacency that we inevitably experience in our broad preparedness agenda. And of course, as I said, November of 2019 is before the pandemic started, just before the pandemic started. So when I went back and really read through the recommendations that came out of the commission, I realized that if only we had had enough time to try to build policies around some of these recommendations, and by the way, most of the recommendations weren't new or novel. They had been expressed past, uh, in, after past crises as well, but they just cycle. We have a crisis, we respond, we invest, we wring our hands, we get busy. And then as the crisis fades in the rearview mirror, the investment, the interest, the focus uh, fades and we move on to tackle other priorities. In a sense, that's human nature, we wouldn't really want people to be constantly focused on the crises that could happen, but it's the responsibility of leaders, our government leaders, our thought leaders, and the people who are in the business of pandemic preparedness, including our public health system, to close that gap between the crisis and the tendency to move toward complacency and keep the energy and the commitment alive. So on the next slide, I have um, sort of defined insanity. When I looked this quote up, I expected to be attributing it to Albert Einstein because it's something that often is um, expressed as a quote from him, but it turns out he didn't actually say it. It is not clear who the source of this quote is, but it doesn't really matter because it, it means the same thing that, you know, it really is crazy to just keep doing the same things the same way and expecting a different result. If you go through and read the after action reviews, after anthrax attacks, after um, West Nile, after Zika, after 2009 pandemic influenza, after Ebola, no matter what after action report you read from the public health perspective and from other perspectives, the basic uh, recommendations for improvement are always the same. 
and yet we never really seem to do anything differently. We make incremental investments. We try to raise the floor of our preparedness a bit. And certainly I don't want to deny that we've made any progress. We have had some substantial steps forward, but steps that are not commensurate with the distance we need to go to really solve these problems and end up with a much different framework for preparedness and resilience. On the next slide, I've described what I think is the one of the frame shifts or one of kind of the disruptive mindsets that we have to really get our heads around. And that is that biosecurity truly is national security. We have had a whole of society impact in this pandemic. The health security issues are obvious. The societal security issues are also obvious, although may not have been included in a lot of the advanced preparedness strategies that our government was ready to execute. Economic security has certainly been jeopardized both in domestic households, but nationally and internationally across so many countries. National security, um, we could say more about the kind of instability and trauma that something like this has at a social level, but you can think of it in more direct terms when you see the nasal cruise ships who experienced the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2 in the early days of the pandemic, you just realize that our troops are at enormous risk. They're deployed internationally and um, their biosecurity really is part of our national security as well. And then that speaks to uh, the international security issues that of course, um, are playing out not just in terms of the conflict, but the potential for uh, some unsavory nations to take advantage of the COVID pandemic or other emergency health threats and utilize them in their own propaganda or worse. So when you think about what we've just experienced and what we could experience if the coronavirus that is the next on the docket is one that has a mortality rate that looks more like MERS. Uh, these are existential threats, not just to our health, but really to our whole global order. And they really merit the same strategic focus, the same investments, the same innovation framework as do our other national security priorities. And if you're a scholar of our broad doctrine in the United States of defense, diplomacy, and development as being intimately interconnected as pillars of engagement and global success. I think we understand that from a national security perspective. We need to understand those same pillars from a health security perspective. We need to be able to defend ourselves against emerging threats, but we also need to get, engage in the kind of diplomatic efforts that recognize that we're all in this together on a global basis and we have to work together to recognize and respond to emerging infectious diseases. And then of course, development. Um, we're not really going to be safe until we have state of the art surveillance, the ability to deliver countermeasures and implement the other tools that we have available in the developed world in any part of the world. So on the next slide, I have sort of defined what I think some of the implications of this frame shift, recognizing that health security, biosecurity are parts of national security. We have to really approach this as a whole of government, not just a health of government um, perspective. And I think at various times in various administrations, we have adopted a whole of government strategy doctrine and planning approach, but it's been difficult to sustain when administrations change and new people come and go. We've also had a very difficult time sustaining investment and have, in my opinion, at least have never invested commensurate with the scale and severity of the threat that we face. We have to develop new strategic alliances so that we can collaborate with our allies and the nations that are in that framework of our diplomacy. We also need to really understand that government alone can't do all of this and that we need to build and utilize broader public partnerships to get the job done. 
We need innovation systems and networks to support the planning and the preparation for a pandemic. And most of all, as I tried to say at the beginning, we can't keep doing things the same way we've always done them. We have to be willing to disrupt the status quo and think differently about these threats. So on the next slide, I have, uh, next slide, yeah, I have just, um, illustrated a couple of efforts to define in more granular detail exactly what some of these disruptions might look like. One of them was a call by the Commonwealth Fund for a national public health system. That does not mean a federal system or a, you know, controlled by the federal government approach to public health, but it means a much more integrated national, state, local, territorial, and tribal public health network that is much more harmonized, that is built in authorities and mechanisms to assure effective and resilient collaboration. And I think most importantly, and something Ken is certainly an expert on is the need for data modernization, data systems modernization that allows the exchange of information, not only across the public health system, but into and out of the healthcare delivery system so that we truly have a health information highway that allows us to have the information we need in a timely way when we have a crisis, but also allows us to um, utilize the same information for planning our priorities and finding opportunities for collaboration around all of the other health challenges that we face under ordinary times. On the next slide, I have a similar picture of a report that CSIS did really defining how the CDC as the sort of leader of the public health network in the United States and in many ways beyond the United States could rebuild the trust that it has lost as a consequences of many of the things that have happened during the COVID pandemic. Um, the recommendations in here include some very specific things that the CDC needs to do in terms of shoring up its leadership, its science, and its overall organizational framework. But it makes the point that much of what needs to happen across our public health network is not within CDC's control. It requires administration and congressional actions. I'm not going to detail those here, but I think, again, one of the most important recommendations is the need for data modernization and the ability to if we can't have the authority to require access to information in aggregate from the various public health jurisdictions, then at the very least, we need to streamline the data sharing agreements that allow that information to be made accessible, not just during emergencies, but in planning and preparing for emergencies as well as, as many other public health um, requirements would similarly benefit. The, um, the, the perspective that a lot of people don't have is that there are some 5,000 jurisdictions that comprise our public health system and the authorities that the CDC has to really um, dictate anything to those jurisdictions is close to zero. So the levers and the authorities that reside at the CDC depend on cooperation. And usually that works fine because we generally are rec recognize that we're part of a single system. But in crisis, um, especially in a crisis that was characterized by the kind of politicalization that we experienced during this one, those agreements and that collaboration becomes very fragile. And that results in a very shattered and fractured um, systemic response, and I think we've seen the consequences of that. On the next slide, I have um, made a point that you'll excuse my exagogram here because the, I did not use real data in constructing this. This is just based on my own personal observations, having gone through several boom and bust cycles of investment during my own tenure at CDC. But funding for preparedness, biosecurity, um, is at a certain level. And then at, after the crisis emerges, there is a sudden bolus of investment, thankfully, emergency money. The problem with emergency money is it's an emergency and it doesn't stay until uh, and, and it only lasts as long as the crisis lasts. 
Um, you might, for a temporary period of time, have a bump up in your preparedness budget, your base budget, but that tends to dissipate over time, either directly through reduced appropriations or through in, in impact of inflation. And then when the next crisis comes, you get the same burst. Um, one of the ironies here is you can't really hire permanent people and help grow and develop their talent on one-time money. You can only do that if you have a sustained budget that allows you to build your workforce at the same time you're building your capability. Another subtlety here is that you'll notice the bolus of investment doesn't usually come until some time after the crisis is recognized and uh, uh, the CDC has no ready available resource to initiate a number of its response, uh, responsibilities until it has money. And so it has to rely on things like the CDC Foundation, who in the pandemic that we are just experiencing hired thousands of people on contracts to be able to go out and support the state and local health efforts um, because the CDC could not have the authority or the money to do that kind of contracting itself. I think a more rational model for thinking about how we should invest in biosecurity is shown on the cartoon on the right. And that is, first and foremost, our baseline funding level is substantially larger, as I said, commensurate with the threat that we're facing, but also um, that upfront investment is not just focused on response and countermeasure development, it needs to be focused on more upstream efforts. And I will come to that in a, in, in a minute. Um, but the other expected outcome of a right-sized approach to funding preparedness, a, a, an approach that, again, would more closely resemble how we fund other dimensions of our national security might be that we would, first of all, have fewer crises because some of them could be abrogated or even prevented. And when they do occur, we wouldn't need such a large bolus of resource because we would have prepared for things and could respond much more effectively at hopefully a smaller scale than was required for our current situation. And then you know, learn from that and restore our longer term sustained investment in biosecurity. So I am not optimistic that I will ever see this come to fruition, but I think it's really what we need to be driving for. And certainly the first component, the increase in the overall investment in biosecurity across our public health network is absolutely essential. Next slide, please. Now, I'm gonna talk about um, this upstream investment that I just mentioned as another frame shift. Because while I certainly understand the importance of having stockpiles and countermeasures ready to roll out of the freezer to vaccinate or treat people who are experiencing an emerging infection, I think we can do better than that. I think our mindset might need to encompass the idea of taking the threat off the table in the first place. I know that probably sounds far-fetched because there's a lot of opportunities for spillover in the animal kingdom to the human kingdom or spillover from one animal species to another animal species, which is also significant threat with many of the viruses of interest. But until we start agreeing that acting earlier to predict threats, to have better awareness of where they're most likely to occur, to act in ways that might actually prevent the spillover from occurring, or to act first and fast when it does uh, spill over so that we can actually contain the threat in a specific area. These are ideas that certainly aren't new, but our investment and the innovation and the creativity going into trying to solve some of these problems is very minuscule, again, compared to the size of the threat that we are experiencing. So I'll just say that, uh, I think this is a huge area for opportunity. This is a huge area for data, um, for all of the geospatial temporal mapping of humans and animals and viruses, for expanding the kind of surveillance that we've now determined can really help us understand the entry and variation of viruses in the environment. Um, we can be looking at better understanding of animal reservoirs and novel viruses that emerge in those reservoirs, I would emphasize bats. I would love to see 
vaccines in bats for certain of the horrible viruses that they're known to reservoir. Um, but we also can think about how we use all of our digital capacities and laboratory sciences to do a much better job of earlier detection and hopefully um, preemption of threats long before they reach the scale of rapid global spread that we've just experienced. On the next slide, I am articulating another frame shift, and that is how we think about advanced countermeasures. Just want to make a point here quickly that we talk about access. Um, we usually think of, you know, somebody's had a product approved in their jurisdiction and now the product is available there and somebody has figured out a way to pay for it. But access is actually very complicated, especially in the context of biosecurity. Um, there's the actualization of the innovation. And by that, I mean, somebody has a new idea and they develop a countermeasure or a tool and move it through the re regulatory investment and science processes to come out with something that's hopefully useful in the end. But we also need to have much better regulatory harmonization to get these things approved. We have a lot of opportunity for innovation in manufacturing. Um, affordability and advocacy kind of go without saying. But if on the next slide, I've just highlighted that two of these areas are particularly important in, in what I would consider to be disruptive innovation. So let me talk first about the actualization, the sort of innovation engine that we need to move things forward. On the next slide, I have um, talked about what needs to be true in order for us to have advanced countermeasures developed. Um, it, it goes without saying that, of course, we need innovators, scientists with new ideas who aren't afraid to fail. Actually, this is a bottleneck. Um, we are experiencing a, a, a crisis in our academic centers and in some cases in our government research areas and even in certain aspects of industry where our more junior, um, for example, postdoc scientists are not paid enough to maintain their families um, because a pay line for scientists in their earlier stages of their career is falling behind what it really takes to live. Um, in a, a family environment in most of the places where these people work. So we're seeing a real loss of our most creative scientists who are leaving the academic research environment. Some of them are going to industry, so there's a gain there, but some of them are just moving on to other areas. And we have to be mindful of the fact that our country is only as good as its innovation, and we really need to as a group of thought leaders, be mindful of what has to be done to, uh, to invest in the science of the future. We need other kinds of investment, of course. Um, government, the private sector, nonprofits, and philanthropists are, really have to put substantial capital at risk. The innovation and regulatory ecosystem is also creating barriers. Um, I understand the need to have access to the vaccine manufacturing or intellectual property to develop countermeasures on a global basis. So that's clearly um, an important aspect of the overall approach to access. But we also do need to keep the incentive system alive so that people are willing to put their investment in this space as opposed to something else that might appear to be more rewarding or have more impact or be more profitable. And ultimately what we really need are true breakthroughs where we go beyond even where we've come with COVID and have a much broader and more advanced approach to medical countermeasures. On the next slide, I've just um, illustrated one little exciting opportunity it is not a, a, a emerging infectious disease. This work was actually targeting HIV and I won't go into the details here, but basically um, just in December, we had an exciting uh, publication of the first uh, step toward developing broadly neutralizing antibodies in uninfected people uh, built from a construct of a protein made from um, a piece of the envelope gene in HIV that had the ability to kind of tease out the 
na naive B cells and germinal centers and coax them into broadening their um, range of, of viruses that they can interact with and gain in, uh, a stronger affinity. So they develop the profile that would be the first step toward developing uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that could protect against um, a variety of HIV strains. Why is this important? Well, it's important proof of concept that broadly neutralizing antibodies may be something you can um, coax out of the germinal cells with a series of uh, prime and boost vaccines, but also it is relevant to many other particularly single-stranded single RNA viruses, including perhaps coronaviruses. Well, there's another um, uh, advanced opportunity that I'm illustrating on the next slide, which is really related to the universal coronavirus vaccine concept. CEPI, the organization that is investing heavily in trying to motivate the science that will support advanced countermeasures in the vaccine space, has um, really outlined why it's so important that we think about universal coronavirus vaccines that uh, uh, protect not just against the beta coronaviruses, which have been the most lethal, but also the uh, alpha coronaviruses that cause the common colds, but those colds can be quite serious in some people. More importantly, the idea here is that these vaccines would protect against coronaviruses that we don't even know exist at this day, that we would have a vaccine that was broad, that protected against known and unknown coronaviruses, but also that was robust with respect to the variants that would emerge as they have with um, the coronavirus we're currently experiencing. So on the next slide, again, uh, an exciting um, we can skip this slide. Uh, on the next slide, um, and some exciting demonstration of how such an approach might unfold. These are early days, I don't have mouse data, but um, to create a, an antigen for a vaccine that contains pieces of a variety of peptides. In this case, the vaccine was constructed from uh, the uh, receptor binding domains from a, a variety of coronavirus that are connected to a scaffold and then used as a vaccine. So on the next slide, I've just um, illustrated that the early days from the mice, which are not really little people, but um, such a construct that contained receptor binding domains from both alpha and beta coronaviruses um, linked to a, a heterotrimeric scaffold was successful in immunizing mice, developed very good uh, and robust antigenic response to all of the antigens that were displayed on it and uh, fully protected the mice against SARS-CoV-2 challenge in um, mice that were uh, reconstructed with the ACE uh, receptor. So again, very early days, but this is the kind of work that we need to push for. We can't rest on the laurels of our current generation of mRNA vaccines. They're great to try to hold down the fort in the short run, but we need to push ahead and try to skate to where the hockey puck is going and really um, invest in advancing our ability to have even better vaccines so that we have broader and durable protection going forward in the future. On the next slide, just um, talking about my last frame shift. I see I have a typo here, um, but to really think about how we can restore confidence in health information and advice. We know there's a, a catastrophe in front of us, crisis in trust, politicalization, infodemics of misinformation and disinformation. Um, we're also suffering, I think, sometimes from information overload, and all of this together has been deadly for many Americans and many people around the world who didn't trust the information advice they were receiving and didn't take the steps that could have saved their lives or the lives of the people they love. So this is a huge area in desperate need for public health innovation. And on the next slide, I'm referring you to a book that costs approximately $3 on Amazon.com was written um, in 2018 by someone in New Zealand, so a pre-pandemic. But if you think about it, or if you know the communication efforts in New Zealand in the context of the pandemic were exemplary, 
And if they were reading this book, I think I could understand why they did such a good job in building trust and bringing their whole nation into a state of pretty good public health protection. Um, so I would really encourage folks to read this book, but a couple of the key points in it are on the next slide, which really helped me think differently and frame shift my own mind, because I've always thought like, well, I just need to do a better job of explaining things in terms that people can understand, or maybe I just need to um, help people become more health literate and they will then of course accept all my left brain information and do the right thing. What this uh, book really has pointed out with some pretty good sociologic evidence that um, people are so bombarded with information, they can't possibly critically review and conduct the kind of analytic analysis we might look forward to as scientists. So they use mental shortcuts and those shortcuts aren't based on their facts. They're based on what they value, what they believe and how they feel. If they hear something that's consistent with their prior beliefs, they ha have an easy time accepting it. And when they hear something that's incongruent, they tend to ignore it. In that setting, if you pour more information into people, you can actually encourage further polarization. And I think we've seen some of that in the context of, of COVID. And the next slide, I just um, represent one other myth of several that were explored in this book. Um, information processing is social. As people, as humans, our default is to trust what we hear and take it at face value. It's only way we kind of avoid that is if we can plainly see that the information is obviously implausible or that the source is unlikable or clearly untrustworthy. But it takes us a lot of mental energy to actually criticize and think about things objectively. So our default is if, if we know the person, we trust the person, it's our neighbor, our peer, our friend, our grandma, um, and we hear them say something, it's just simplest for us to trust what they're telling us. And then we get into the belief system that tends to ignore information that is contrary to what we're hearing from the people we trust. Next slide. So. Um, let me just skip over this because I think um, we can get to this point right here. When I was um, at CDC in the middle of the anthrax attack, Dr. Copeland was the CDC director and uh, our colleague at Harvard conducted a survey of Americans to determine who they would like to hear about terrorism and anthrax from. Uh, of all the government leaders that were available to speak to the American public, the CDC director was the most trusted. And that was a really important observation. Put on the next slide, um, I think the take home message here is that the person people most wanted to hear information from and who they trusted the most was their personal doctor. And, and what that tells me is that we can't look to the White House or even the CDC in Atlanta as the most trusted purveyor of information, especially now. We have to get out on the street ourselves and be influencers as representatives of the health uh, intelligentsia or the people who are privileged to have access to information and the ability to translate that. And so on the next slide, just my, my ask or my hope is that we can use the trust we've earned by virtue of our position and our location in our networks, our professional networks, but also our family and community networks to really be an activist when it comes to helping to engage and inform the people we know and love, but also to correct min misinformation when we can and uh, collectively or individually try to speak out when we hear dangerous or deliberate disinformation. We're, we are often community experts and while publishing in prestigious medical journals is a good thing, of course, um, that doesn't reach the people who really need to have confidence in the information that they are receiving. So when we can, we also need to try to, again, take it to the streets and be an influencer in, in whatever network you operate in, 
even amongst our professional colleagues who sometimes, especially if they're not in public health or infectious disease, aren't entirely in the loop of what is happening in the world of preparedness or pandemic response, and they will uh, help amplify getting better information. Um, so let me just stop there, Ken, and say that I think I've tried to make the point that we have to stop doing things the same way. We have to get out of this cyclical crisis, complacency, crisis, complacency mode. We also have to recognize that we shouldn't just put our emphasis on responding and developing countermeasures in the context of the biosecurity threats we're facing. We need to um, think about how we can go upstream and take these threats off the table or at least reduce the severity of their occurrence and contain them much faster than we've been able to do so far. So I look forward to um, your comments and the questions that we might have received. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, people are obviously uh, dying to get a little bit of your expertise uh, here because the questions are filling up. So let me let me lead off with a couple, and then we've got um, a nice conversation to have with our participants. Um, since you really spoke a lot about misinformation, um, I want to point out um, something that probably most people on this call don't know, and that is that you, as director, uh, created a social media center within the Centers for Disease Control. You anticipated the role of communication through other channels besides um, besides uh, traditional public health communication. And uh, today we see uh, both tremendous opportunity and peril in this world of social media with public health uh, kind of uh, perhaps playing catch up in a way as everyone had to play catch up uh, under these very new conditions of a pandemic. If you were designing a uh, uh, an agenda for a social media center starting today instead of starting a um, decade and a half ago, what, what kinds of uh, activities would you want to see them take, take up? You know, I think that if you were, I think what you're speaking about, Ken, is, was the Center for Health Marketing. Yeah. And the idea was that communication and communication sciences were a legitimate public health science and that we needed to deploy those sciences in ways that really helped people understand and make use of the health information that we were creating. Probably it was a mistake to use the word marketing because it implied to a lot of people that we were doing something, you know, that was uh, commercial and that really wasn't the intent. But I, if, if I were starting over again today, I would double down on the science of communication and particularly the science of social media communication because I think we have so much to learn about how this works and how to um, participate in it in meaningful ways, but also how to um, counteract in the context of the misinformation and disinformation that we're seeing. There's so much we don't know and yet, um, we can feel the power. The, another myth that I didn't go into is the myth that it will self-correct. You know that ultimately the you know the the right information will prevail, and that is absolutely not the case. We're seeing that in every topic, not just health topics. So you're um, you've stepped over um, to another. Uh, government agency or right next to it in the NIH Foundation. And there is a pretty interesting development within the NIH, which is the creation of ARPA-H. Um, how do you see ARPA-H playing in this ecosystem? I, I love the concept of ARPA-H. And I think this, again, this, this concept of we can't do things just the way we've always done them. We have to be bolder. We have to go for breakthroughs. We have to be faster. Um, and we have to engage even more convergence around the problems that we're trying to solve. I have always been a person who believes in the value of the wise crowd, um, you know, that network effect. And I think ARPA is a really important contribution uh, to that network of science that the NIH so brilliantly prosecutes, but ARPA can do some things that the NIH can't do. 
And of course, the NIH can do a lot of things that ARPA can't do. But by having you know, that engine of bolder, faster fail, um, it particularly technologically oriented or digitally oriented science, I think it, will, can, it has the opportunity to really add something to the culture of science, but also to the um, success in really um, jumpstarting some new ideas. Uh, like the FNIH, ARPA-H also has the opportunity to engage a broader set of, of um, players. Uh, FNIH, um, obviously, one of the main reasons we exist is because we can bring in the private sector to work with the government, which is otherwise tricky. So these private-public partnerships have the magic um, capacity to bring uh, an even wiser crowd together. You know, for me, I started the FNIH, and I could be in a room with institute directors, like some of the smartest people in their field in the world, together with the presidents of research and development from the most important biopharmaceutical companies with the leading academician, their researchers in, in various areas. And they would all be concentrating on how can we do certain things together in a way that lets all boats float higher. It's, it's just an amazing opportunity. I think having ARPA-H in that loop will, will even bring more energy to those kinds of collaborations. That's great. Very exciting to see that launched. So take some questions from the from our crowd now. Uh, Diane Ballou, who's a former CHIP fellow um, and a, a machine uh, learning oriented uh, researcher. Um, how to balance um, the sharing of sensitive data for public health? I think he's interested in, you know, this you know, and, and there's a few questions about that. So let me also add in another from Monica Jang, which is um, given the exclusionary nature of the assertion of IP rights, how, does, how, how do we try to get as much data as possible, um, as democratized as possible to service um, the public health? So these questions that are, that are percolating in here have to do with um, the sort of often inaccessibility of data from the healthcare system um, around uh, privacy uh, data from other sectors that might have intellectual property associated with them. Uh, how do we sort of cut through this to get the data we need into the hands of public health decision makers, or at least under the eyes of public health decision yeah. makers? So, so let me just start first with just the idea of sensitive data, which I would I'm thinking you mean privacy issues, sort of HIPAA kind of sensitive information. Yes, and that was I, the meeting. I, and as you know better than I do, that that is that is not a technically difficult problem to solve. Mostly, um, I'm aware that even when we characterize something as anonymized, that there are ways that certain anonymized information can be identifying. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm not dismissing how challenge it can be in a specific case. But I think the kind of public health information that we were desperately seeking in the context of the pandemic was something as simple as how many people have died. We could not even get reliable vital statistics um, just because these data systems are so antiquated that the timeliness was abysmal. Um, and that has, it's a long story, but basically, um, when a, somebody dies, the doctor has to fill out the death certificate, usually doesn't necessarily fill it out right. Um, there's nobody there to troubleshoot it. It takes a long time to get it through the county and state governments before it's sent to the CDC. The CDC has learned that often the significant proportion of the death certificates are wrong. They have to go back and manually correct them by calling up and gathering information, and the whole thing takes forever. Clearly, AI and um, algorithms to help improve the coding and entry of the information in the first place and digitizing all of this, avoiding fax machines, et cetera, is part of that solution. But I, I think if we can start with the most basic information, that kind of opens the information highway and creates channels for us to solve for the more sensitive kinds of information that would be coming forward. I also have experience um, with the FNIH because um, the research collaborations involve both kinds of information and involve very sensitive, uh, potentially identifying information of the people who are participating in some of the clinical studies that are going on. 
but also proprietary information. Because when you bring together, for example, in the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium, we have 30 partners, a, a significant proportion of them are a small biotech companies who are trying to develop gene therapies for rare diseases. And obviously for them, you know, what they're working on is very proprietary. So you have to develop things like federated data systems where people can share the information, but it's, um, uh, you know, a, 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 we call it a curated approach to being able to get answers to questions, but not actually having access to the raw data and so forth. So there are solutions to this that you probably know better than I do, but I think we're, um, we, we haven't really even accomplished what we could do with the technologies that currently exist, let alone thinking about how we can disrupt that and uh, accelerate that ability to get our hands on the information we need. Great. We have a question about money uh, from Alan Wolf. What would be a rational ask in terms of a percentage above current CDC funding levels to prepare better for the next pandemic? I know a lot of I know some some of the legislation that was sort of on deck didn't did not go through. Uh, yeah, so. you know the the numbers that people pull out of the air are very varied. Um, some would say eight billion. Some would say you know two billion would you know really make a difference. And I don't think it's wise to just give a sudden huge bolus of that kind of money because it takes time to be able to determine how money can be used most effectively. But keep in mind that the tradition is for the vast majority of that money to be immediately turned around to the state and local health departments. So what I would think would make the most sense is to first be really clear, not about how much money you need, but what is the result you're aiming for? Um, how are you going to achieve that result? And then price out what it's going to take to make that happen. We, we tend to think of budget as the forcing function rather than an enabling function to help us afford to do the things that would make the most difference. Having said that, it's very clear that, you know, whatever the number is, it is substantially larger than today's number. And we are so far behind in terms of real money that the per capita investment in public health in the United States is on a downward trend uh, for the past couple of decades, even um, not accounting for inflation. So we are totally underfunding our public health system in every sense. Agreed. A uh, question from Christina Astley. Um, to your points about innovators not being afraid to fail and the importance of restoring trust, public health gets more attention with failures than successes. Do you think we can improve trust by shifting how we frame public health innovation risks that failures may happen, the innovation process is critical, and the strength of our public health system rather than building trust primarily on being the source of uh, information and recommendations? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really thoughtful question. You know, I, I, I have often thought about our successes that are unnoticed because when we succeed, you know, nobody even knows we exist. And it is the failures that um, create the attention. Uh, when I was the CDC director, um, I won't say which state it was, but the state legislature cut the infant screening hearing program to such a level that it was impossible to conduct infant hearing screening. And the courageous public health director finally said, we're not going to do it at all because you have now brought our budget down below the level of feasibility. And it shocked everyone in the community and including the medical community. And it created quite a stir and amazingly the legislation restored the investment. But sometimes I think in public health, we, we just keep doing more with less and we just trying to find a way and you know, we work around and we work more hours and we do this and that and the other thing to um, compensate for what is a woefully underfunded um, entity instead of specifically saying, as you might do in a medical environment, if you don't have the resources to do something of good quality, you don't do it. And in public health, we just keep trying to do everything because we're 
dedicated, but we also know that it's worth trying. And the end result of that is we've kind of created an environment where people don't think they need to fund us because we manage somehow to stumble along without the money that we need until something like a crisis occurs and then it becomes all too clear how woefully inadequate the support has been for our system. Question from Platon Lukyanenko, one of our uh, new postdocs. And that relates to a question I would like to ask too. And that is, um, you know, you, as I recall, came from UCSF in clinical infectious disease and made this very big decision um, to uh, commit to, to real uh, challenging um, and important public service. Um, so if you could comment on that and also answer Platon's question, which is, what's a good way for early career researchers to learn more about policy? How can they better position mm -hmm. themselves to someday be more involved in policy? Well, thank you. I haven't thought about that transition from UCSF to, <laughs> to government service in a while. You know, um, I probably, in a sense, was, had one foot in public health, even when I was at UCSF, because after I finished my training and my chief residency and fellowship, I based myself at San Francisco General Hospital, which is the public health hospital for the city and takes care of all the patients who really suffer from the social determinants of health as much as they suffer from their medical problems. So I experienced in a sense, all of the beginning days of the AIDS pandemic when everybody was dying, but I also experienced the revolving door of what happens when you bring someone into the hospital, treat their alcohol withdrawal or their, you know, their pneumonia, and then they go back out onto the streets of San Francisco or into other very challenging home environments, and they come back in a while later. So I felt like the healthcare delivery that we were providing, although of extremely high quality, was really not having the kind of health impact that these people desperately needed. Um, that was part of the reason why I went to Berkeley to get my MPH while I was a junior faculty member. And it really did change my outlook because I hadn't had much training in population health perspectives before I went there. And um, I, I realized that sometimes you can have a bigger impact by working in a different way um, to still have an influence on individual people's health. Having said that, um, I will admit that until the pandemic, I was still going back to San Francisco General to attend <laughs> wards because I love clinical medicine and I loved my patients and I loved the nurses and the environment there. So I never really completely left. I'm still on the faculty there and on the faculty at Case Western Reserve as well. So um, with respect to the policy engagement, um, my policy training is ad hoc. Um, so I, I'm not a good uh, advisor on what's the best way to get there, but clearly there are master's programs in public policy or master's programs in public health with concentration in health policy that are very helpful. Um, and then there are you know, shorter courses and credentialing opportunities. Uh, like Harvard has a good one, for example, um, Kennedy School. And, and so there are ways to get that formal didactic training, but sometimes an experiential opportunity is also a good thing if, if you're ever in a situation where you can you know, participate in a policy think tank or take an internship in a place like CSIS or you know, the Commonwealth Fund or people who are really involved in um, policy analysis and policy development that can be very helpful. I don't know the, what the availability currently of online courses are, but I'm sure there must be some that could be useful. But at the end of the day, reading helps. I read The Economist. Why do I do that? Because it's broad. I love their titles of their articles. They're very clever, but also uh, they cover a range of global policy topics. And I find that to be an efficient way to kind of keep my perspective on a number of things. And then I also read um, Foreign Affairs, which is the Council of Foreign Relations journal. And it's quite excellent and buried in the diverse opinions and perspectives that are presented in it. But it helps me 
frame the kind of international policy in a, in a more sophisticated way than I would certainly be able to come up with myself. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if you have just inspired a few people on this Zoom <laughs> to pursue some form of, of uh, policy work um, or, uh, or even public health service. Um, your perspective uh, uh, is so valuable and sharing it with us at this moment when really it's uh, a, a perfect moment for reflection and for looking into the future um, uh, is very generous of you. Um, and we are extremely uh, grateful. Thank you very much, okay. Dr. Berber. Again, thank you so much. But it, it, I also really do want to thank you because the people who are participating in this probably recognize you as an erudite professor with a great deal of uh, expertise, but your own contributions to public health and public health informatics have been absolutely astonishing and uh, inspirational from the other direction. So I guess this is a mutual admiration moment for the two of us, but I, I just truly respect what you're doing and it's never been more important. And as we look at what really is the, the nervous system of our public health, it is data and data systems and data utilization. So thank you for your leadership and for doing this. I'm honored thank to participate. Thank and you. when it gets hard, I, I look up at the patchwork quilt on my on my wall <laughs> to remind me of why we're doing it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much yeah. for those kind words. Bye bye. Thank you. And don't forget to join us as we uh, continue this series with um, two more before the summer. Um, Karen Copenhaver who is a legal counsel at the Linux Foundation and will be uh, discussing uh, open source software uh, and how to get the most power out of it. Alex Wilchko, the CEO of a new company, Osmo, which is digitizing Scent. It is an amazing, amazing story that's uh, just getting launched. Robert Langer, uh, most cited engineer in history. Ian Lipkin, virus hunter. Uh, extraordinaire, uh, Rick Burke, co-founder of Stat News um, out of the Boston Globe, Tom Mayer, medical director at the NFL Players Association, who has done more to improve the health of uh, players in this microcosm of um, the NFL, which is a very interesting reflection of issues from the larger healthcare system. Molly Ann Brody, who you may not know by name, but you've read uh, the results of her surveys, because those are the ones that are quoted across the media from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Toby Cosgrove, a storied CEO uh, from uh, the Cleveland Clinic for uh, many years, who's going to offer his perspective. And Christina Farr, uh, health tech investor, investor and former technology and health reporter for CNBC. Uh, please keep in touch with us at CHIP, uh, www.chip.org. That's where you can find, among other things, uh, the recordings of these uh, Landmark Ideas events, including not too long from now, uh, the recording of Dr. Gerberding's talk. Uh, let your friends know. Uh, we love seeing you on the Zoom and looking forward to seeing you next month.